Shalom, family. Shabbat Shalom. The soul food topic on tonight is, does the standard of righteousness change over time? Okay. I'm bringing this topic out because, you know, when you're dealing with Christians, um, they tend to think in their mind that um, their lifestyle and their conduct is acceptable. They don't live according to the laws of the Most High God. You know, they have their own Jesus rules that they abide by. There is no accountability. There is no adherence to any true righteousness. And so any semblance of holiness that was exemplified by the Christian church many years ago, that no longer exists. You go into the black Christian church or any Christian church for that matter, you'll see that the standard of righteousness has been lowered because there is no keeping of the law. And where there is no law, then there is lawlessness. Where there is lawlessness, of course, there is sin. Okay? And so some of the things that the Christian church may have been against in years past, they've lowered their standards. They've lowered their moral strictness on certain things. Whether it, you know, pertains to, you know, uh, interracial dating. Whether it pertains to... Um, fornication, sex before marriage, whether it pertains to homosexuality and lesbianism and things of that nature, whether it pertains to any of the scriptures, okay? Because there is no acknowledgement of the law, keeping of the law, then the standard of righteousness changes. So I want to beg the question, does the standard of righteousness change? For myself growing up, I remember different topics being brought up in the Christian church and the explanation for things, like if the scripture said one thing and the Christian church did another, the explanation from the minister or the pastor was that that was the old time, that God is doing a new thing. You know that, you know, that was the way the apostles, that's the way the old prophets, the old Jews and Israelites did things. But God is moving in a, in a new generation. He's speaking in a new voice. This is the type of rhetoric, rhetoric you would hear from the Christian church to justify their lawless deeds. But it's important to understand that the standard of righteousness that was set from the beginning does not change over time. It's not a democracy where we can um, change or alter or manipulate God's laws. His law is the same. It will not change. It has been us that have corrupted our way and have changed the law of the Most High God. Okay, so. What's it called? Title over there? It's called Does the Standard of Righteousness Change Over Time? Um, can you grab me Proverbs chapter 22, verse 28? Five Proverbs chapter 22, verses 28. Okay, yeah. Proverbs 22, and verse 28. Okay. Remove not the ancient landmark which thy fathers have set. Remove not the ancient landmark which thy father has set. So this is pertaining um, to the civic law of land and property. Okay, when markers of the land would be laid, it was considered wickedness and unjust to when uh, the forefathers laid markers to take the markers and move them or the landmark and move them to increase your boundary of land unjustly you didn't pay for it you didn't ask for it. you didn't seek permission you're just moving it so that you can have a bigger allotment of land okay but on a spiritual level you could look at this as the laws and the traditions of our forefathers the righteous traditions of our forefathers read it one more time remove not the ancient landmark which thy fathers have set remove not the ancient landmark or Remove not the ancient standard, the righteous standard which thy fathers have set, mm -hmm. the things that they have declared, the example they have showed. Do not alter it. Do not change it. Okay? From there, next chapter, uh, Proverbs chapter 23, verse 10. 
pretty much saying the same thing. Go on. Proverbs 23 and 10. Remove not the old landmark and enter not into the fields of the fatherless. Okay. From there, Deuteronomy chapter 27, verse 17. To give better understanding to this law. Yep. Deuteronomy 27 and 17. Deuteronomy 27 and verse 17. Cursed be he that removeth his neighbor's landmark, and all the people shall say, Amen. Okay, so the law says, Cursed be any man who removes or moves an ancient landmark. So on a physical level, it is considered wickedness and a curse unto you if you take that which was determined between two parties and on your own without any permission, you unjustly move those marks so that your allotment of land is bigger. Stealing from your neighbor. Man, I don't like how he got, he got the real nice area over here. The grass is real nice. Ain't nobody around. Let me just move this rock real quick. That rock been sitting there for over a hundred years. This rock was laid here by the forefathers to determine that you know, along this line, along this border would be your land and your neighbor's land. But unjustly, you have moved it. The standard was set. There was a line of demarcation, if you will, set in stone, determined for years. And you of your own lust and desire have picked it up and removed it out of its place. Cursed be thee. That's on a physical level. Now think about that on a spiritual level. The example of righteousness has been set. The line of demarcation. You had a question or something? No, I'm just... I had some motion wind earlier. Get your mind together. All right, so the line of demarcation has been set. Okay? And you're not supposed to cross over that. So on a, on a spiritual level... The Most High declared in His Word the things we ought to do and the things we ought not to do. But on a spiritual level, we have become corrupt. We have become wicked and decided, you know what? I don't like the, the boundaries that the Most High has laid in His law. I'm going to pick up the landmark, whether it be a branch or a stick or some other marker to determine boundary. I'm going to pick it up and move it 100 yards north or east, or west, or south, because I like it better over here. Cursed be that man. Cursed be that man. Okay? Um, Gail, I have you grab, oh, matter of fact, okay. Um, Job, chapter 24, verse 2. I'll read that. Job, chapter 24, verse 2. Some remove the landmarks. They violently take away flocks and feed thereof. Okay? Because, so because of the lust of their heart and their greed and their wicked desire, they remove the landmarks so they can take things that do not belong to them. That's on a carnal level. But on a spiritual level, when you remove the landmarks, that means you're lusting after something you should not desire. The Most High put this law in place to show man his sin. And to keep him from going after that which is evil and unclean and which is profane. But the evildoer said, uh-uh, I, like, I don't like these laws. I don't like these rules. I'm going to move it. That way I can be justified in my wickedness. Just like these men who violently take away flocks and feed thereof. If they remove the landmarks, then they have, um, it's, it's almost like a legal clause. If you've moved, removed the landmarks and you don't have any evidence to prove that you moved it and the flock is on your land and no one can come and say, you know, he stole it from me. Be like, look, it's on my land. These are the things that have happened on a spiritual level because we have rejected his ways. And we go after our own form of righteousness to our own detriment. OK, mm -hmm. so I'm going to have you read the article that I. Gave you to read. Yeah, start at the top and just read that. Okay. The Black Church, the oldest institution. Speak up louder so I can hear you. The Black Church, the oldest institution and pillar 
of the black community has historically dictated the community stance on homosexuality. Salakia, so the black church for many years has been the staple, the pillar of black community, okay? And when it came to the topic of homosexuality, the black church had a uniform uh, notion or, or, or verdict, oh, that's a better term, verdict on that topic, that it was sinful, okay? According to the Bible. Read on. Either you don't talk about it or you condemn it, says journalist and blogger Lynn B. Johnson. It is daunting to come out only to face the fear and misunderstanding of society in general, but many LGBTQ African Americans must face that same ignorance within the very institution that has for so many been the centerpiece of their community. Although no largely African-American denomination has issued a public statement outlining its position on homosexuality, the stance of individual churches and ministers are revealed on Sundays. Okay, so pretty much saying that the church had a view on homosexuality, that it was wrong. Okay, but um, the times have have changed over the years to where it was absolutely wrong. It was a uniform verdict across churches. Now it's become very laxed. Mm -hmm. Churches as a whole have viewed homosexuality as, you know, what did you say earlier? Either you condemn it or you don't say nothing about it. You just kind of turn a blind eye to it. Mm -hmm. Okay. And when these members of the LGBT community, whether they are active homosexuals, lesbians, transgenders, or whatever, or supporters of the movement, they come into the church, okay, because again, it is the most popular um, center of fellowship, if you will, for our people still. When you come into the church, they want to be able to enjoy the benefits of the church experience but then you have this big fat elephant in the room. The pastor holds up this Bible and said he lives for this Bible when in reality we know he doesn't. But then he's faced with the challenge of having to live by this Bible, but then also deal with the homosexual so like your members in his congregation. Read on. The motto of the black church seems to be don't name it, don't claim it. Salakia, so <laughs> that's kind of the thing. We don't, the, as a people, when it comes to homosexuality, it's like, you know, it's bad, but we don't want to accept these things. We are more, more prone to want to ingratiate ourselves with homosexuality and homosexuals in general than to condemn their lifestyle. So when someone comes into the church, comes into the church body and shows flamboyant homosexual homosexual tendencies and lifestyle and all of that is more like just kind of turning a blind eye, you know, just not bringing those things to the forefront. If they do say something, it's just like, brother, you know, that's not right. Well, this is who I am. God made me this way. And, all you know, all this type of foolishness that is spewed in the Christian church. That's the defense of the homosexual. God made me this way. And so it's just like, you know, don't name it, don't claim it. You know, you shouldn't act that way. I remember um, someone asking Joel Olstein some years ago about homosexuality. homosexuality. Where do you stand on the homosexual uh, agenda? He said, you know, I, I don't have anything to say about it, but according to the Bible, it's just not the best way, the best life to live. I'm about trying to guide people to living their best life. Like an issue like gay marriage, people look to the ministers for, for, sure. for, uh, for leadership. Sure. Is that an issue that's for you against the rules? Um, you know, it, it, it would be, but Mark, I, I don't, you know, I don't really focus on a lot of those things. I try to stay in my lane of what I feel called to do. Mm. Now that, that does come up in, in interviews and things, but 
just don't feel like that. That's not my core message. My core message is how do you, how do you have a healthy self-image? How do you let go of the past? How do you raise good children? How do you reach your dreams? Now, I know that is part of it. Yeah, because if you have 45,000 people, yeah. some of them are gay. It, it, oh, yeah. For yeah. example, among Absol- other things. Yeah. Absol- absolutely, and everybody's welcome. But my, my take on it is, you know, it's easy to make one issue to become known for that or to, or to let it sidetrack your message. And, you know, if you look at our congregation or the people that come to Yankee Stadium, including myself, we all have issues. Everybody's on a journey. So I try to say, here's, here's my focus, here's my lane, you know, and that's, that's kind of where I But, you know, if, if that's what you want to do, you know, then you have the freedom to do that. But according to the Bible, you know, God says that's not the best way to, what kind of foolishness is that, man? This is the attitude of the Christian church, black or otherwise. This is the attitude. You know the Bible con- condemns it, but we do not have, as they would say, the, uh, uh, ter- um, what's the word I'm looking for? Testicular fortitude. That's the word I'm looking for. The testicular fortitude to stand and condemn and rebuke and reprove homosexuals when they come into the congregation and they have no desire to repent or seek deliverance or anything. They want to remain in their homosexual way, but still lift their hands and worship God in the congregation and not have anybody say anything bad about them. Because when it comes to that homosexual agenda, LBGTQ, RSTUV movement, it definitely is a pride movement. That pride spirit is heavy on homosexuals. Okay, and when you try to bring the word out. And rebuke them and reprove them according to the scripture, your brother, your sister. You know that pride demon really come out because it does not want to be reproved. It does not want to be shown the way of righteousness. It does not want to be pointed out to it that it, you're in the way of error. You're in the way of perdition and destruction. That this is not the way God made you. You are not a biological man that, you know, by mistake is is really supposed to be a woman. That's a lie. Okay, read on. Okay, the motto of the black church seems to be don't name it, don't claim it, says Mandy Carter, a founder of the progressive organization Southerners on New Ground. uh, Salakia, that's code for um, trying to find... find, uh, Establish a black church that makes it okay to be gay in the congregation. That's all that is. Code for that. Go on. This informal church dictum has led many LGBTQ African Americans to find and create other places to exercise exercise their spirituality. Spirituality. Salakia. So, it, just as I said, it is. They want to find alternative ways to worship. What is that? On a spiritual level, that's removing the ancient landmarks. The Most High declared in his word that it's an abomination, according to Leviticus and elsewhere in the scripture. But in our wickedness, we say, "Uh, I don't like that. Like the men of Gibeah, the Benjaminites of Gibeah, who were homosexual sodomites. The children of Israel came together as one and approached and confronted the tribe of Benjamin and said, yo, Give us these Gibeonites, man, so we could put them to death for that wickedness. And Benjamin, you know, uh, defended them. And it led to civil war. That's the same attitude among our people. You may not actually be lying down with a man, being a man yourself. You may not be partaking in homosexual activity, but we're supporting the movement. Just like those Benjaminites have removed the ancient landmark. Curse be he who removes the ancient landmark. Keep reading. As Cheeks, the bishop, put it, I would rather sit as, in... As what? Cheeks. I was going to say <laughs> Bishop Cheeks, but that's the way it's written. As Cheeks, the bishop said... <laughs> as Cheeks, the bishop put it, I would rather sit in a tree... And talk to God, then go to a church that doesn't affirm me as a gay man. Bishop Cheeks has made an active effort to ensure that his church 
Inner Light Ministries is a diverse and inclusive church for GLBT worshipers. So instead of condemning the wicked lifestyle to get the people to change and return back to the, the, to the natural order of things, they rather um, pro, pro, proliferate the wicked activity and keep them conditioned to live sinful so that they ultimately can be destroyed. It doesn't make any sense. That's removing the ancient landmarks, coming up with your own righteousness. But there's, there's, there's precedence for this. Our people did this in times past. Apostle Paul talks about it. Let me grab it real quick. Book of Romans. Bear with me. Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1, verse 26. I'll read down to 28. For this cause, God gave them up unto vile affections. For even their women did change the natural use unto that which is against nature. Meaning the women were lying down with women. Lesbianism. 27. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one towards another. Men with men working that which is unseemly and receiving in themselves that recompense of the error which was meat. So... It's only the burning in your lust that causes you to remove that ancient landmark. So the women wanted to be with the women. And you see that amongst our women, the daughters of Zion, they've rejected the natural use of a man. I don't want no man. I want another woman. The man is saying the same thing. I don't want a woman. I want me a man. It's crazy because every time you go, um, I watch a, a commercial you know, whether it be for Hulu, whether it be for Facebook or TikTok or whatever, you're seeing these different advertisements and it's trying to show diversity and you see this lesbian gay agenda, even a Target commercial that came on. And the thing that's crazy is they always target black men. They'll have the advertisement, it'll have white women and white men and they're together holding hands or whatever, but then you'll see a gay black man Two gay black men or black man on there with makeup on and saying, I feel beautiful in the camera and all that stuff. Why is this strategically, you know, placed on our men to make them effeminate and to push that agenda even the more? Because they burned in their lust. And so the Most High gave them up to those vile affections that they may be destroyed by the wrath of the Most High God. Let me read to, to 28. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. They didn't like to retain the most high God. They didn't want to keep the law, statutes, and commandments, so they removed the landmark. I'm not going to put it right here. I'm going to pick it up and move it and put it where I want it to be. So the line of demarcation is changed so that the, the standard of righteousness is blurred. People can't determine what is good and what is right or what is good and evil because now it all looks about the same. That's why now in the Christian church, it's kind of don't say nothing. You know, just let them be. Just pray for them. That's the attitude. When someone's in sin, laid in, in sin in the Christian church, you don't condemn them. You don't rebuke them. You don't reprove them. You just say, just, just pray for them. While that wicked influence, you know, is and that demon is able just to stir up more evil in the church mm -hmm. and influence more evil. Because when one person comes in, one gay person comes into the congregation and feels comfort mm -hmm. and feels warmth and, you know, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Just feels welcomed by everyone in the congregation. That means that spirit is going to go and grab seven other spirits. And before you know it, in a few short months, few short years, you have half the congregation filled with gays. Because the standard of righteousness has been changed. The ancient landmark has been moved. Preacher can't say nothing. If he come across Romans 1, he's just going to have to skip over it or read through it real quick. And get to something else. Especially when you count on those 
LGP, LGBTQ members to pay faithful tithes and offerings every Sunday. That helps pay the mortgage on the church. Mm -hmm. That helps pay your, your rent at home. That helps keep the light on, man. You can't tell DeAndre he a filthy devil and he need to repent. You can't do that. Not when DeAndre is putting that kind of cake in the in the offering plate. Absolutely not. Read on. Some gay affirming churches, such as the United Fellowship of Metropolitan Community Churches, are ethnically and racially inclusive. But over the past few decades, new churches also have been established specifically to welcome and affirm LB LGBTQ people of color, such as the U Unity Fellowship Church Movement, which was founded in 1985 by the Reverend Carl Bean and other gay and lesbian African Americans. The church now has 17 locations across the country. I didn't Shalaki. know that. So... No more is it just the, the regular denominations of Protestant Christianity like Baptist or Lutheran or uh, Pentecostal or Apostolic or, you know, Methodist. Now you got the LBGTQRSTUVWXYNZ denomination of the Christian church. If you can't find the kind of doctrine, you know, that, that scratches that itch for you as a homosexual within the standard traditional denominations, now you can just go to a gay denomination. Mm -hmm. And you'll have a gay minister who will preach a gay gospel, preach a gay sermon, and affirm, like they said, you know, Christian uh, gay affirmation churches. Mm -hmm. They will affirm your homosexuality and give you peace of mind. Not preach of wrath and condemnation, but preach inclusion and love for everybody. Read on. Some long established black churches also have made progress toward being more welcoming. In April 2000, the union. Salakia, so you see that gay ministers, gay and lesbian ministers, are getting together. You know, and funding the establishment of a gay denomination. But in because be, the, the thing is, is it, the Christian church and this whole uh, gay agenda has become big business. OK, so the gay members who were paying tithes in the traditional denominations of these black churches were giving money. Right. But when they didn't feel quite as welcomed or feel as comfortable as they wanted to, they were making their exodus out of the black church and into these gay denominational churches. that are more gay affirming. Now, when that money is trickling out of the black churches and into these newer churches, the black ministers are saying, we got to compete to try to bring the gays back. You understand what's going on here? Not try to win their soul. Not try to, you know, cause them to be delivered and set free and go back to a, a heterosexual lifestyle. But no, we got to <coughs> try to become more inclusive so that we can win them back so we can get that money flowing. Homose that homosexual agenda, is, there's a lot of dollars behind it. There's a lot of finances behind it. And if you can have that in your back pocket, then you have a good, you know, revenue flow coming through that's the reality this is big business and so that's why you see heterosexual church members supporting lbgtq movements because first it's politically correct and in that you know it helps to you know what i'm saying increase the revenue for the church read on in April 2000, the Union United Methodist Church in Boston voted to become the nation's first black Methodist church to officially welcome and include gay and lesbian worshipers. Mm. The year 2000 also saw the founding of United Methodists of Color for a fully inclusive church, which engages people in the subject of heterosexism 
and homophobia in Christianity and the United Methodist Church. We are accomplices through our silence on these issues, says the Reverend Gil Caldwell, who sits on its ad advisory board. We must connect the struggles as different as they are. Salakia, so you see that rhetoric being pushed there in the black church. If we're silent, we're accomplice, accomplices to the problem, to the issue. And so we're being condemned if we're being condemned by the gays, if we don't speak up in support of them. When in reality, we should be speaking up to condemn them. Read on. Um, okay, we are accomplices through our silence on these issues, says the Reverend Gil Caldwell, who sits on its advisory board. We must connect the struggles as different as they are. Individual pastors also are making a difference. I hope I'm doing some sharing of faith that recognizes all human beings as God's creation, says Reverend Timothy McDonald III, the founding pastor of the First Iconium Baptist Church in Atlanta. The pastor sets the Hot tone. Lamb. Yeah. If the pastor is scared, homophobic, or sends out negative signals about gays and lesbians, it's going to spread throughout the congregation. Salakia. So if the pastor says anything that makes a homosexual feel uncomfortable, it spreads throughout the congregation. Why is that a bad thing? Isn't the church congregation supposed to be the one place where the truth of the scriptures can be taught? can be expressed, can be verbalized, but so you're supposed to, for the sake of the homosexual, reject the teachings of the Bible and preach an accommodating sermon to make the homosexual feel comfortable and feel welcome and not send out any negative signals. Okay? Like I said, it's big business. If you turn them away, then you're turning away not only the money, but it's a trickle down effect because this movement has grown so big outside of the church on a political basis that those, um, those uh, who are heterosexual in the church that support the LBGT community will be offended and they will leave as well. Why? Because their family members, their loved ones are gay. In the church, say they love Jesus and pay their tithes and offering and come to church faithfully. If the pastor speaks against it, they will be compelled to leave as well. Although they're not gay, they accept it. And the pastor cannot deal with that. So he has to deal with the challenge of trying to, in his mind, live for the Bible, but then also be accommodating to the demographic of the congregation and the kind of people that he's preaching to and preach a sermon that makes everyone feel okay. Makes me think of the song by the OJs. Got to give the people, give the people what they want. So it's like the pastor is trying to come up with something to make everyone feel good. I can give y'all all something you can believe in. That's why the message is no more about wrath and indignation, you know, from, from Almighty God. It's more about prosperity and about harvest, about blessing and about, you know, uh, inclusion. The, 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 the sermons have become more inspiring, more political based and less scriptural based. Read on. As more churches open their doors to LGBTQ parishioners and more leaders publicly, publicly recognize those of different sexual orientations and gender identities, fewer, fewer LGBTQ African Americans will be forced to choose between their identities and their faith. So it's making it harder for individuals who have any desire to try to live for the Bible, they're going to have to make up in their mind, what do you want to do? 
do if you're gay and you have been taught that being gay is wrong and you're going to the church to try to find some guiding light unto deliverance, now you're being uh, ambushed with this alternative doctrine that your lifestyle is actually okay, according to God, according to the Bible. And so it's like, okay, I got to reject those old teachings that condemn homosexuality and gravitate more to these new doctrines that affirm homosexuality. And then if you are heterosexual, but you have gay family members or whatever, now you having to deal with the same thing. Do I condemn it or do I bring them in and show love that way? Quote unquote, because we have no understanding of what love is according to the most high God. Because we believe that God loves everybody and he just, you know, he's just full of love all the time. But that's the furthest thing from the truth. Okay, so now people are being challenged. Do we still do the way we've always done it? Or do we now go into, go into these gay churches and accept that doctrine? Okay, is that all? All right, so I'm going to read one last scripture. We'll be done for now and finish up another day. Malachi chapter 3, verse 6. Malachi chapter 3, verse 6. For I am Yahweh, I change not. Therefore, ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. So when we're talking about does the standard of righteousness change over time, you know, we brought out the scriptures about removing the ancient landmarks. Even in Deuteronomy saying, curse be ye if you remove those ancient landmarks. Okay? The reality is the most high God does not change, nor does his standard change. We change, as the article said. People didn't like it. Gay people were feeling uncomfortable, so they said, let's get together and make our own denomination." Let's create our own churches. So we're going to leave it right there and finish the rest on another day.